Thanks, Catherine. And as you'll see, some of this overlaps with the story of the Imperial Valley, among other things, because one of the goals of Harry Bridges was the march inland to help organize farm workers as well as people in canneries and warehouses. So the, the network that was trying to get Harry Bridges was trying to destroy farm workers' organizations and other things. And the other side that was defending Harry Bridges was trying to advance the right to organize in the fields and in the factories and on the waterfront. So this, I'm sure all of you know Harry Bridges, but this is when he was a schoolboy in Australia, in Melbourne. And he's wearing a uh, Charlie Chaplin button on his lapel, because he was a big Charlie Chaplin fan. Uh, and then, of course, he went to sea escaping from a troubled home in Australia. And then he came ashore in 1920, and that's 1922 in Coos Bay, Oregon, uh, with his future <coughs> wife, Agnes Brown. And of course, he emerges as a labor um, leader in 1934, and he immediately becomes the target of this um, anti-labor alliance. One of whose members was this person up here, uh, Raphael Bottom, who was uh, in the Immigration Bureau, and who was very much about deporting aliens, and especially he was very highly anti-communist. So Harry was one of the people he began to pursue. Uh, and these are Harry's lawyers, um, whose archive, uh, whose collection is part of the Labor Archives and Research Center, now called the Norman Leonard Collection. But these lawyers were Richard Gladstein, Aubrey uh, Grossman, and Carol King, who comes here uh, to defend Harry Bridges in 1939. So um, each side is an archival army, and I've come to appreciate archives more and more as I realize how elusive sometimes truth is. And um, the journalists are often called the fourth estate, but I think historians and archivists are the fifth estate who try to clarify and tell the truth to the extent we can. And sometimes our truth helps. In this case, uh, these archival, these two archives both per uh, persecuted and also helped um, prevent Harry Bridges from being deported ultimately in this 20 year battle. So I'm looking at archives as arsenals, because I think documents can be powerful weapons, and we should appreciate them. But they're not just held at universities. Uh, lawyers can create archives, and so can lots of other people who all want to, in some sense, keep a hold of what has happened in the past. And of course, people can be living archives, and you can use oral history, among other things. Um, so these documents were weapons and they um, get used in the deport deportation hearing uh, at Angel Island in uh, July, September 1939, and then later trials of Harry Bridges. <coughs> five times they uh, tried to deport him, and five times uh, he managed to resist with the help of his lawyers. And the evidence, so here are some of the documents that have to save Harry Bridges. And here are some of the documents that were trying to trap him and deport him. And uh, these documents you can find in a number of different archives now. And the Labor Archive and Research Center is one of those places. The National Archives in Washington, D.C. and a number of other places. So I'm going to talk about documents as ammunition and intelligence gathering, spies and counter spies, and archivists as combatants. Uh, because I think weapons can be thought of in a lot of ways, and documents can be powerful weapons. And this our uh, warfare happened, began before Harry Bridges ever arrived in San Francisco, uh, but he became a key target from 1934 onwards. There were two coexisting networks. One was pro-employers, and some of the people in Imperial Valley that was just talked about were parts of that archive. Um, Associated Farmers was the catch-all name for many of these, but so were sheriffs and postmasters and police and the naval intelligence uh, arm and the military intelligence uh, and employer groups and patriotic groups and the American Legion. It was a very complex. And then, for
for the Alkiri side, of course, were union and labor organizers and um, a group of left-wing lawyers who also helped him. And they were each involved in intelligence gathering on the other side. And, um, and the pro-employer Carvel Network, though, had access to lethal firepower because of their allegiance to police and sheriffs and the military and private and munitions companies because they actually used guns and tear gas, among other weapons, state and federal agencies, and vigilante groups that were deputized. So there was, industrial warfare was uh, both figurative and literal uh, in this time. And the other side, defending bridges, forged alliances with sympathetic federal and state um, officials, leftist lawyers, especially the National Lawyers Guild and the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, and each of these, has archives and collected intelligence to use against the other side. So the poor employers had the upper hand because of their ties to the state, federal and state, but in the mid-1930s there was some shift and some of this happening at the federal level uh, and you can talk about the New Deal. And then in 1938 the California state government and the Los Angeles city government shifted in a pro-labor direction, and that also had uh, benefits for Harry, whose the first deportation hearing occurred in 1939. Uh, and they had collected a documentary arsenal, which they carried in trunks and, and suitcases to Angel Island. And a good deal of that is at the LARC. And when I began to see these documents, I began to think about where did they come from? How did they find them? Uh, historians are like detectives trying to find clues and trying to know the source. And answering that question helped to discover the archival network that defended Harry Bridges and also the one that was persecuting him and tried to deport him. And one of the clues that puzzled me was these different sets of numbers on the backs of the documents that were in the LARC. And the top number is obviously hand-drawn, but the bottom number I recognized is uh, how exhibits before congressional hearings are labeled, because I've seen those. And I began to wonder, how did these kind of uh, exhibits for uh, a hearing, a Congress or the Senate, get into these labor uh, lawyers' collection? Where did they get those things from? And that was uh, 2012. Uh, and how did the team defending Bridges gain access to correspondence from the Los Angeles Police Department Red Squad? Uh, how did they get those? And then there was a letter from Margaret A. Kerr, who is the Better America Federation, which was an organization, an anti-communist organization in Los Angeles, which was established by uh, Harry M. Haldeman, the grandfather of H.R. Haldeman of Watergate, sorry, but the family was involved in surveillance and control politics going back three generations. Uh, so H.R. was just the third generation. And the number at the bottom is more official than the one at the top. And of course, who first gained access to the LAPD records? Uh, they had card boxes like this with indexes, and I began to pursue this and uh, historical work that see six years later sort of came up with answers. Mm -hmm. um, and the answers were there in the LARC, the Norman Leonard papers, and then in the California surveillance collections, and then other collections I visited, the La Follette papers, the Dyes Committee, the Van Damon collection. And just yesterday, I was going to the Bureau of Immigration at San Bruno and finding more about the people trying to deport Mary Bridges. So, intelligence gathering, archives, and especially if you want to know about the conflict between um, employers and labor in California. And lawyers were very adept at gathering information, and it turned out the Senate La Follette Committee was one of the key sources for the documents that the lawyers had, and also the National Labor Relations Board staff. And when the government of California passed into pro-labor hands in 38, they could get access to spy records because the former governor of California had his own labor spy. 
but once uh, it had passed into other hands, those became accessible, and some and Hair Bridges lawyers got some of those as well. So these are them: uh, Carol Weiss King, Richard Gladstein, Aubrey Grossman, and Harry Bridges, and of course Harry's daughter, who is pretty obscured behind her father, with some of the documents that they began to use and collect. So the story starts <coughs> earlier before Harry comes to the U.S. And two of the key protagonists, um, Ralph and Damon, uh, who helps to set up the military intelligence division in Washington during World War I. Uh, and currently there are about 70 boxes left of his collection at the National Archives. And Heber Blackenform, who worked for the uh, NLRB and helped uh, write the Wagner Act and helped set up the La Follette Civil Liberties Committee, who was an opponent of industrial espionage and wanted to protect the rights of labor to organize. So these two guys, both from the military, but taking opposite sides uh, when they went back into civilian life. Ben Damon helped to set up, as I said, the Military Intelligence Division. He also created a corps to conduct it counter espionage among the civilian population, and among those targets were labor unrest, racial disturbances, foreign agitation, and he worked with patriotic vigilantes and detective agencies conducting industrial surveillance. So he helps to form the beginnings of this pro-employer intelligence network. And some of the people who joined with him is this person from the Bureau of Immigration, Raphael P. Bonham, uh, who despised at aliens. They were subversive from his point of view. He didn't want them voting. He was, uh, in some ways, if you hear Donald Trump today, you'll hear Raphael Bonham in the past. Very similar views about aliens and, and who can be trusted and so forth. And he was all very pleased with his ability to expel anarchists. Uh, he was from Oregon, from Salem, but he uh, was primarily in Portland and then Seattle. Uh, and he was the person chasing Harry Bridges like a bloodhound for his entire career. So, uh, of course, there was a Red Scare in 1919, 1920, uh, sparked by the Seattle General Strike, bombings, police strike, and steel strike. And in the midst of this, Harry Bridges arrives in San Francisco, sailing from Auckland, New Zealand, bound for San Francisco, where he disembarked in April in the midst of the Red Scare. Um, so Harry arrives as this kind of frenzy, anti-communist frenzy, is um, taking shape, and as a new uh, and a new organization that will become another part of the alliance against Harry is taking shape, the American Legion. Uh, and in that will be uh, one of his key um, opponents, whose name is Harper Knowles, uh, who is a private investigator in San Francisco. And he also works for employer organizations, especially associated farmers. Uh, and William Hines, who was an industrial spy and an undercover operative for the LAPD, during the waterfront strike in 1922, and then he is going to also participate in this, uh, and he's in the American Legion as well as in the police. And this organization, the Better America Federation, sets up in 1920, and it lobbies to have a Red Squad in the LAPD. It also lobbies before it's shaped to have a criminal syndicalism law passed. And they begin to collect reports on subversives. Uh, and Margaret A. Kerr is a key person in developing the collecting the records. Uh, Hines is another one, and his notebook is in Washington, D.C., of who he saw as subversive. And among the subversives, of course, are groups he defines as communists, unions, but he also hates pacifists. And he doesn't like Methodists. Um, so, sorry if you're a Methodist, but uh, some Methodists were interested in social justice, and that made them a problem. And they were also interested in peace, and that was a problem too. Uh, and 
So it was quite interesting what uh, targets there were. So here it comes in, uh, and of course in 1930 and the Depression, uh, a lot of unemployed street protests, the um, uh, Red Squad gets active fighting in the streets. Bottom gets more and more concerned about aliens creating trouble, and he uh, meets um, Heinz and passes on his views on the ABCs of communism, blaming aliens for violence. But on the other side, Blankenhorn uh, has discovered widespread industrial espionage, and he decides he's going to fight the modern spy who operates to destroy unions and steer up racial spite, and he begins to investigate employer tactics in the steel strike of 1919. You can find his, uh, the reports that he uh, wrote online now in the www.archive.org, and they talk about violations of civil liberties, false propaganda about Bolsheviks, blacklisting, the dust of espionage, Alajan's provocateur, all the different methods employers use to destroy unions. And in 1933, he joins the staff of the National Labor Board and then the NLRB. And he wants to rewrite the laws to protect unions against employer tactics and stop industrial espionage and other underhanded employer tactics. Uh, on the other side comes the Congressional Committee, and um, some of it was just mentioned, the Un-American Activities Committee. But there were a succession of these committees. Uh, over time, starting in 1919, and then there was one in 1930 under Hamilton Fish, so it became known as the Fish Committee. And the anti-communists like Hines and Bonham testified to that committee. And this is Bonham's testimony, and he's complaining about the need to prove that people were communists before he can deport them. And of course, this will be what they will try to do to Harry Bridges, prove that he's a communist so they can deport him. Uh, but they're already uh, in motion. Then they come to San Francisco and to Los Angeles, and Hines uh, fills an entire volume of their reports with exhibits he's collected uh, throughout his career with the LAPD. Uh, and he very much testifies about communist agitators targeting naval personnel, waterfront workers, industries that would be essential for military production, and farm workers. So already they're beginning to worry about organizing farm workers. And the danger of communist penetration in Hollywood. Another issue that will come to the fore more and more later, but it's already being expressed in 1930. At the same time, Van Damon has retired from the military, is in San Diego. He's disturbed by his testimony and sets up an intelligence archive in his home. And these documents and reports begin to circulate between the Better America Federation, the American Legion, Military Intelligence, Naval Intelligence, the Industrial Association of San Francisco, Associated Farmers, Local Sheriffs, Postmasters, Police. And all of these are uh, against union organizing, especially among the agricultural workforce and the waterfront. And um, Harbor Knowles uh, becomes an important combatant from his office in San Francisco. Uh, so here are some of the people involved in this uh, network, because the uh, 70 boxes of Van Damon papers are in uh, Washington. And uh, this is the blue bar is what it was like in 1932, and the red bar is 1937. And a lot of undercover spies who were working for the LAPD, among other things, state agencies, uh, and the Better America Federation, military intelligence. So it's a private public surveillance network uh, in operation running through Van Damon's home, but spreading around between all these different parts, covering all of California and places beyond. And then, of course, comes the strike, and Harry Bridges becomes a key target of this network. As a union activist, waterfront, he fills the bill, and he's an alien, so there's the hope that they can deport him. And the industrial warfare that happens, of course, makes more and more uh, concern among uh, business interests. 
uh, who began to become more active in the network and the general strike. Uh, he's a strike leader, a union militant, and an alien, uh, and therefore a threat uh, to many people. Uh, and anti-union combatants began to mobilize, and one of them is this Harper Knowles. Another, of course, is Thomas Plant of the Waterfront Employers, Mayor, Mayor Angelo Rossi, and John Francis Nalen, who is uh, the front man for the Hearst interests, um, who play a role in Governor Frank Merriman and the San Diego Police, among others. And newspaper publishers are key um, proponents of this, and Hearst is one. Uh, and the other, of course, is Harry Chandler, and he owned a large estate, agricultural estate, in the Imperial Valley. Mm -hmm. So he was very opposed to organizing agricultural workers. He also had a shipping line, so he didn't like waterfront strikes. Uh, so the LA Times was very much involved in the anti-labor uh, alliance, and so was Hearst um, as another part because his interests, of course, in agriculture and in mining. And these use of um, cartoons and images, uh, and Harry Bridges became one of the key exponents of uh, communism, disloyalty, and so forth. And they unleash pay on vigilantes to smash the communist newspaper, to attack union halls, and to arrest people uh, in various ways. And Harry becomes one of the targets. The governors and this uh, network began to join forces, and each of these governors has their own industrial spy, Merriman and the governor of Oregon, and also in Washington as well. So it wasn't just a California operation, it was all the way up and down the Pacific Coast. And nationally as well, uh, Red, Harry becomes defined as a Red leader, uh, he's a troublemaker, said it warned about Reds, radicals in full sway. But the other mo network also begins to mobilize to protect Harry. And one of those components is the ACLU and Ernest Besick, who was in LA and comes to San Francisco after the San Francisco police have killed two workers during the strike. And he begins to investigate, organize against police and vigilantes, and forms the Northern California branch of the ACLU, tries to repeal the criminal syndicalism law, fight deportation, and also challenge spies. And one of those spies who's after Harry Bridges is Stanley Doyle. And Bessick tries to take a picture of Doyle, and Doyle and his friend try to destroy Bessick's film. Uh, so this was a scene in San Francisco, uh, and the uh, whole issue of, on the other side, of course, was the labor press, who tried to expose the spies and the other parts of this network. So you have two sides and different kinds of these media, each trying to explain. And then comes a significant shift with the Wagner Act, which Black and Horn has helped to draft, and the growth of the CIO, industrial unionism, and of course the pro-employers get even more threatened by the growth of pro-labor legislation and by the growth of the CIO. Uh, and they try to prevent the Wagner Act from being enforced, and Black and Horn persuades the Senator Robert La Follette to chair a committee to investigate these attacks with another senator, Albert Thomas, uh, from Utah. At one time in the past, there were progressive Mormons. Um, and Albert Thomas was one of those. Well, all right, maybe there are some now that say that, but Albert was quite a powerful person who believed in education and believed in uh, health care for the, and various other strange notions. Uh, and he helped write the GI Bill of Rights and put education in it, as well as health care. Uh, so an unsung hero. And they began to expose the spies. Uh, and one of them was Stanley Doyle, the person whose picture was trying to be taken by Bessick. The Pinkerton Agency and others 
were all called to account. For the first time, employers got themselves investigated instead of the other side. And, uh, and to counter the LaFont Committee, another Un-American Activities Committee gets created in 1938 uh, under Martin Dyes. Uh, and this will, th these two committees will fight it out as part of these two different competing networks. And one of the first <coughs> things they do is send, a, send their spy to California. Edward Sullivan goes to LA, then to San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, meets with Bonham, the police, the Higher Patrol, Industrial Association, Waterfront Employers, Knowles, <coughs> Doyle, and the American Legion, and they're going to get witnesses to target Harry Bridges. So much of the reason the Dice Committee is formed is to get Harry Bridges. Uh, and it becomes very clear from the very first time the meeting comes uh, into existence, but behind the scenes, the secret records tell you that's who they're after as they meet. Uh, and here are some parts of the network that Sullivan meets who are after Harry Bridges and the Bureau of Immigration, the Highway Patrol, the Portland Police, and of course Red Hines from the LAPD um, Red Squad. But at that very moment, they're becoming embroiled in a scandal, and Hines will lose his job by the end of the year. Hooray, hooray. <laughs> okay. um, so Sullivan goes back to Washington, and he tells Martin Dyes what he's found, and Bonham advises Dyes to demand the file from the Department of Labor about Bridges and denounce Francis Perkins for not having deported Bridges. <coughs> and it's pretty clear that Perkins, the NLRB, the LaFollette Committee, Bridges, the CIO, and the New Deal are the key targets of this Un-American Activities Committee uh, as they begin uh, to meet. But unfortunately, Sullivan is discovered to be an anti-Semite and a labor spy, so he has to go. But others take his place. So uh, Margaret Kerr comes to town with her bundles of documents, as you can see here, from the Better America Federation, wearing a very nice hat. Um, and the committee goes into secret session to hear a testimony concerning the communistic connections of Harry Bridges. And she presents herself as a patriot rather than a front person for Los Angeles employers. Then Knowles comes in October, and again he presents himself as a patriotic American legionnaire and not a front guy for the Associated Farmers. But there he's also after Harry Bridges, and he's also warning the Democratic Party has been taken over by communists because he's trying to prevent the election victory for a pro-labor governor in November. Uh, the, but uh, the La Folla Committee, because the LAPD has uh, come, become involved in the scandal, they tried to bomb an investigator into their corruption, and the investigator didn't die. And then the whole Red Squad gets involved in that scandal, and the governor is found to have been selling commissions to be in the police and the fire, and he gets defeated. So the Red Squad records become available, and the LaFollette Committee and the NLRB begin to go through those records. And they, of course, have friends among leftist lawyers, including Harry Bridges' lawyers. And that's how the documents that I uh, wondered how they got to the lawyers, how they did. Um, and I, I also found in this other collection that Knowles had planned to spy the LaFollette Committee, and her name was Frances Wheeler, and her records are there, and she's watching what's going on, and notes the LaFollette Committee has documents concerning Hines, the police, the Industrial Association, and the spy. She reports on meetings with Bridges, Gladstein, and Grossman, and their joint celebration, so each side is spying on the other. Um, and then, d despite their efforts, the Democrats win, and these records get available the, kept by the state police and the governor, providing additional intelligence. So the Gladstein and Grossman Archive has affidavits and evidence from the Fallout Committee, from the uh, NLRB, and also from the state government, from their spying networks. 
and Bridges has gained new allies, and the Van Diemen Archival Network has lost the LAPD Red Squad. Um, so, and I also found that even the congressman on the Dice Committee is giving material to the lawyers. Uh, Jerry Voorhees, who's from LA, has a, a letter from someone talking about how Bridges is being spied on by the Pinkertons, and that letter gets to the lawyers. So either Voorhees or his staff must have passed it on. Uh, the the Fallout Committee loses funding at that point, but before they leave California, they give copies of documents to Gladstein and Grossman. Uh, and Knowles isn't served with a, a, a uh, doesn't have to testify, but the documents that the La Folla Committee has are available to, uh, to, to the lawyers, and they take them with them uh, when they go out to Angel Island. Uh, trunks and suitcases carefully indexed with the red numbers, and they are going to use these documents to show that there was a frame up, a plot, uh, to get Harry Bridges and that all these different people are involved and that some of them have been paid to testify and they're going to in some sense impugn all the witnesses that come up against Harry Bridges uh, and so here they are going uh, taking the documents and when Knowles comes to testify they introduce letters between Knowles and Hines Knowles tries to get the stolen correspondence suppressed. Uh, he has to, though, admit meeting with Bonham, Doyle, the Industrial Association. And so the professional spy had met a counter spy. And he is no longer seen as necessarily just a patriot, but uh, a spy for hire. And the guy who is the examiner at the de deportation believes that Bridges and his side are the honorable ones in this conflict rather than the prosecution witnesses who are portrayed as disreputable labor spies, sphinks, stool pigeons, and criminals. Um, and the documents that they have gathered in various ways help them to make this case. So Harry walks free. Um, but of course, the other side who've been trying to chase him will not give up. And the Smith Act, the major anti-communist legislation, was actually part largely intended to get Harry Bridges a uh, new weapon against him. And then it's used against him. He's brought to trial in 41 with new witnesses and evidence collected by the FBI. The final of all reports um, appear in 42 and 44, and anyone who's interested in organizing among farm workers or uh, what California employers are doing. Those volumes of the fault committee are just very valuable sources of knowledge about uh, union organizing and all the tactics used against unions. But now the archival warfare has moved to the Supreme Court and here is the uh, judges who will make the decision in the second trial of Harry Bridges. And of course some of them will become well known for their belief in civil liberties, including Hugo Black and William O. Douglas uh, and Frank Murphy, uh, who was a pro-labor governor of Michigan and then attorney general. And he narrates the history as Landis, King, Grossman, and Bridges had presented it. And he had very eloquent words that he says uh, the record in this case will stand forever as a monument to man's intolerance of man. Seldom, seldom ever in the history of this nation has there been such a concerted and relentless crusade to deport an individual because he dared to exercise the freedom that belongs to him as a human being and that is guaranteed to him by the Constitution. And then um, Murphy lays out all the entities that were after Harry Bridges, the entities that were in that pro-employer network that the documents demonstrate. Uh, and then he talks about how they use wiretapping, searches and seizures without warrants, other forms of invasion of the right of privacy. Um, privacy. This opposition to Bridges has been as persistent as it has been undaunted. And so ultimately, this power of 
documents the surveillance network manages to prevent the deportation of Harry Bridges despite the five efforts to, uh, to deport him. Um, so the archival the combatants defending Bridges finally claim victory after two decades of documentary warfare despite the power of the forces arrayed against them. 